Uh, hi, hello everyone. Uh, in this recording, I will present the forthcoming GFE article titled Searching for the Equity Premium, joined with the Hum Buy at Yukon. So in this paper, we argue that a DSGE model with recursive utility, search frictions, and the capital accumulation is a good start to forming a unified theory of asset prices and the macroeconomic dynamics. So the motivation of the paper is actually pretty well known and, um, and a fairly important puzzle um, in macro finance, that's the equity premium puzzle um, by Marion Prescott, 1985 article. Uh, it turns out understanding the equity premium puzzle in general equilibrium production economies has been extremely challenging over the years. Uh, many researchers have uh, tried to address this uh, anomaly and uh, Rowan Host's 80, uh, 1995 paper, uh, a book chapter, uh, is really the first art, first work that uh, tackles the equity premium puzzle uh, in GE product in production economy. And the Rowan Host point is that uh, look, uh, due to consumption smoothing delivered by capital investment, and uh, it turns out the consumption risks are just too small. Okay, so and uh, um, Urban Yearman came along in '98 in the GME article. So um, Urban argues that basically to prevent uh, the investor from from smoothing consumption, you have to introduce adjustment costs. So Urban was using internal habit and uh, convex. Uh, um, um, adjustment costs, actually he was using installation function that is pretty cool. And he argues is that uh, you can generate some consumption risks, uh, but uh, unfortunately the, um, the due to internal habit, the volatility of interest rate is just excessively, uh, is too high. Interest rate is it's excessively volatile. And then um, uh, Tallarini 2000 the GME article, it's uh, quite influential. So the, the, the key result is that uh, there's certain uh, separation uh, proposition holds uh, that, that, that divides macro from finance in the sense that in a GE production economy uh, with the recursive preferences and that you get to increase uh, risk aversion as much as you want such that uh, the sharp ratio can be matched uh, well, macro dynamics are un uninfected once you pin down uh, EIS into temporary elasticity of substitution at one. So therefore uh, uh, you feel free. So uh, if you work in macro, you can, you can feel free to ignore asset prices and thinking uh, you can increase risk aversion as much as you want uh, without affecting quantity dynamics. Um, so I should be pointed out that the uh, Tallarini paper only matches the sharp ratio, not equity premium for the market and uh, not the stock market volatility. Um, so we're gonna show that uh, in our paper, um, uh, we're gonna show that uh, uh, this separation result doesn't really hold. So because of the difficulty in, in understanding equity premium in GE production economy, so macro and the finance have been pretty much developing uh, in a separate way. Okay, so the, the, the label macro finance is quite a bit like an oxymoron. Okay, so in finance, so researchers uh, basically uh, live within endowment economies, specify exotic preferences, uh, quote unquote, and exogenous cash flow dynamics to match the, the equity premium and the stock market volatility and all and their time variation, but uh, they ignore firms. Okay, so uh, so leading leading frameworks including external habit, long run risk, as well as um, uh, disasters, the the real disasters framework. So on the other hand. Uh, in macro, the, the leading DSG models, uh, for example, by Christian Eichenbaum Evans, the new Keynesian DSG models, uh, they largely ignore asset prices um, with, um, with uh, while well, CEE were actually using um, so internal habit, but the, but the more popular choice would be uh, lock utility or power utility. 
So, uh, so, so risk premiums in these models are, are, are pretty small, uh, close to zero. So, because this is this is this is um, uh, befitting their economic questions, because they were targeting, they were focusing on uh, aggregate quantities. So that's the background, and uh, our long-term goal is really to have a unified model that researchers could use to address both asset prices and macro dynamics simultaneously. Okay, so we call this a unified theory, a holy grail of macro finance. So uh, there are many questions you can ask. Uh, so, so far we have, uh, uh, we, have we have managed to provide answers to uh, reasonable answers that we feel comfortable with to three questions. So there are many more you can ask later on by extending the model further. So first question is, what are the micro foundations for the exogenous, often complicated cash flow dynamics in asset pricing models? So for example, long run risk model or disaster models. So uh, to what extent, second question, to what extent uh, do time and risk premiums matter quantitatively for macroeconomic dynamics? So according to the uh, separation theorem uh, in Tom's early work, so you would argue that, uh, look, risk premiums would not matter that much for quantity dynamics. Uh, um, so finally, the last question is, how large is the welfare cost of uh, uh, business cycles in a general equilibrium production economy that replicates the equity premium, right? So if, if welfare cost is persistently uh, small, tiny, 0.005%, as reported by Lucas's um, classic calculation in his 1987 book. And you would argue that uh, there's really, really uh, not much need to smooth, to manage um, economic uh, movements, right? Economic volatilities, so, or, or business cycles for that matter. The counter cyclical um, uh, government policies don't really matter. So what is the need if welfare cost is so small? So we're, we're, we're gonna provide the, uh, much, we're gonna, we're gonna estimate much larger welfare costs, orders of magnitude larger than uh, what Lucas uh, estimate um, uh, implies. So, so as noted, we have a DSG model. So after, after um, um, 10 years of effort, so we have, we think we have figured out the essential ingredients uh, for the unified theory. Uh, this would be uh, the SGE model with search frictions, recursive utility and capital accumulation. So it took a long while because we had to, we had to work out all the computational algorithm. So we calibrate the model to consumption volatility in the Jordan, uh, Schlarick and Taylor macro history database. The DSG model implies a leverage adjusted equity premium and 4.27% per annum, uh, right in the ballpark. An average risk free rate of 1.97%, uh, uh, and uh, importantly, uh, relatively high stock market volatility of 12.4%. So, relative to compared to the prior attempts of DSG. Uh, production economies, so this stock market volatility is actually uh, two to three times higher than prior attempts. So the model also implies strong time series predictability for stock market access returns and stock market volatilities, some predictability for uh, consumption growth volatility, and the weak to no predictability for consumption growth and the real interest rate. And in this case, uh, capital investment actually plays an important role in, in explaining the stronger predictability in stock market access returns and the weak to no predictability for consumption growth. Without capital investment, the consumption growth predictability will be exaggerated. So in other words, uh, capital investment not only raises the hurdle of matching equity premium because of consumption smoothing eliminates consumption betas, uh, but also the presence of capital investment actually helps uh, eliminate or, or, or reduce substantially the amount of predictability for consumption growth. So we have uh, the key one key mechanism in the model is wage inertia, 
uh, we provide a, a new estimate that we, 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 we did some um, geometrics analysis, basically economic history. We pull together a historical US wage uh, series and we estimate the wage elasticity to labor productivity, it turns out to be uh, 0.27, which is relatively close to what we have in the model. So again, the separation result is gonna, separation between macroeconomic dynamics and risk premiums is gonna break down. Uh, in particular, in our model, risk aversion strongly affects quantity dynamics. So lower risk aversion, lower risk premium, and the smaller macroeconomic volatilities as well, and lower unemployment rate. Okay, so uh, and, the, and the channel is going through risk uh, risk premium because it provides a discount rate channel. So and um, um, it turns out, despite the average labor share of output calibrated to be um, seventy four point six percent, the capital share in market equity in market value is ninety two point six percent. Uh, and the counter cyclical. I'll come back to this point uh, later on with more details. So in first at first glance, this result may be uh, surprising, but turns out to be uh, quite, quite, quite natural. It just mm, took us a while to eliminate some of our own uh, false beliefs. Um, so, and the mean and volatility of hiring returns are an order of magnitude uh, larger, uh, higher than the mean and the volatility of investment returns respectively. Because in the model, we have both capital and the employment uh, as productive inputs, and uh, we have hiring return. The stock, well, stock market return is a value weighted average of investment return and hiring return. It turns out that most of the stock market return is driven by investment returns. Okay. Again, I'll come back to this point later. Uh, timing premium, so uh, it's only 16.1% uh, is quite reasonable uh, relative to um, um, uh, long run risk model would be like over 30%. Uh, certain specification of the uh, disaster model with time bearing um, disaster probability that's over 40%. And our timing premium uh, feature in our, in our model is quite reasonable. So welfare cost is um, huge, 33.6%. Uh, on average and strongly counter cyclical. So this really means that um, monetary and physical policies are extremely important in, in curbing uh, bad times, in curbing uh, disaster uh, risks in the model. And finally, we also have downward sloping term structures of equity return and volatility. So in other words, a long list of goodies uh, that, that we have they have, that we have been able to uh, generate using a relatively simple model. All right, so um, before heading into the model, so, um, so there, are, there are many challenges. So in the DSG production economies, so in particular, if you wanna, so why, why, why is it so difficult to explain equity premium um, in, a, in a production economy? In particular, uh, most of the prior attempts have been done in the RBC model or different specifications of the real business cycle model or stochastic growth model. So it turns out dividends tend to be counter cyclical uh, in the stochastic growth model. Uh, different people have talked about it, uh, but uh, we find the, the article that really um, uh, articulates this point extremely well in that persuaded us. Uh, in particular, it's uh, Countdown Brown and Lockstore 2010 RFS paper, right? So um, uh, Lars and Kawata basically argue, look, dividends equal uh, profits minus investment and profits equal output minus wages. Okay, so uh, with frictionless capital, uh, frictionless labor market, wages are basically uh, equal to marginal product of labor. And in particular with Cobb Douglas production function, marginal product of labor is proportional to output. In other words, it's as pro, uh, pro as output. And that turns out profits are as pro, pro cyclical as output, right? Uh, however, because of consumption smoothing, 
capital investment is going to be more procyclical than output uh, because investment is tied up to Tobin's Q. Q is stock market va uh, valuation is forward looking, right? Investment is forward looking. It's going to be bumping around uh, in response to shocks and uh, to smooth consumption. And the consumption smoothing is uh, intrinsic feature of our modeling because uh, our utility function is concave. So the expected uh, utility uh, is higher uh, if we can somehow, or else being equal, somehow uh, reduce consumption volatility. So that's why uh, investment is more pro-cyclical than, uh, than, than, than their output. Uh, however, back in the first bullet point, the investment enters dividend with a negative sign. So you have profits that are as procyclical as output and dividends is, uh, sorry, and the investment is more procyclical than output as a result, dividends have a strong force to be dragged towards countercyclical. In other words, dividends tend to be countercyclical. The stock market, instead of being risky, uh, stock market is a hedge. It turns out to be an insurance contract. All right, and you can break this uh, bricks that break the key channel of consumption smoothing by throwing adjustment capital adjustment costs. Uh, that's what the urban 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 Yerman did in his uh, 98 article, and then uh, then uh, then then dividends will no longer be counter cyclical, but still the amount of consumption uh, risks is still small. Okay, and that's uh, um, that's this bottom line is that this is the key challenge. Uh, facing DSG uh, production economies. So, so, uh, so this was our key motivation. We have to do uh, something drastic, okay? So, uh, so instead of uh, fixing, uh, keep extending the stochastic growth model, we're gonna, we're gonna build on the search model of the late labor market. The search model takes labor market friction seriously. And the Diamond and Morton's and Pierce's model is the dominant framework uh, for analyzing labor market. So we, we have been trying to integrate uh, the macro labor literature with asset pricing literature in the past decade. So I think this paper, we finally are able to pull everything together and uh, hopefully, well, you'll be the judge uh, to what extent uh, uh, we have achieved our goal. All right, so the search model overcomes the core challenge in explaining pro dividends and uh, thereby the equity premium, right? So in the search economy with the employment as another labor, as another productive app, um, uh, input, dividends are gonna be equal to profits minus investment minus vacancy costs. So wages, so profits are gonna still equal to output minus wages. So, and uh, um, one, one accounting point is that the wages are current period expenses. Okay, they should be wages, wages should be expensed away from economic profits or accounting earnings when it comes to measurement. It is only vacancy costs that firms pay to attract the workers, uh, future workers, right? So vacancy costs that deliver some future benefits that once you have a worker in your company, you mm, that saves you the need to, to, to hire another worker next period net of separation, of course. So this is the way vacancy costs uh, should be considered as investment in workers. So, uh, so vacancy costs uh, are the other investment as noted. All right, so uh, more importantly with search frictions, wages are inertial. They're gonna be detached from the marginal product of labor. Even with um, a Nash standard Nash wage, Right, so I know in the macro labor literature, uh, researchers oftentimes say Nash wages as uh, are flexible, but uh, I'm, I'm, my starting point is really the frictionless uh, labor market in which wages equals uh, um, marginal product of labor uh, proportional to output in a Cobb Douglas case relative to that baseline um, uh, specification, Nash wages are inertial. Uh, in particular, uh, they are no longer, wages are no longer equal to marginal product of labor. And uh, in this case, profits are going to be more pro cyclical than output because wages are inertial, wages serve as a kind of operating leverage. 
Okay. So uh, again, due to consumption smoothing, investment and the vacancy cost or their sum, uh, it's going to be more procyclical. Their output, the same consumption smoothing intuition uh, is going on. Uh, however, because of wages are inertial, operating leverage, profits are going to be more procyclical than investment vacancies. As a result, dividends are actually uh, becoming uh, uh, highly procyclical. And this is the amount of uh, indulgence uh, cash flow risks that can be generated within the search model. And uh, this is the, um, uh, what we believe to be the answer, uh, to be the key to the unified theory of asset prices and macroeconomic dynamics. All right, so now let's dive into the model. I'm gonna dive into the model and then talk about the calibration and, uh, and the quantitative results, uh, all kinds of quantitative results, comparative statics, as well as some uh, additional, uh, additional implications from the model, some of which uh, are actually surprising. All right, so the overview of the model and uh, um, uh, we, 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 we like to keep the model as simple as possible. And uh, this is our attempt. So uh, we're gonna, so we're gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna have a DSG. So we're gonna have you recursive utility. We have to separate the risk aversion from EIS, which is a well-known, uh, well-known requirement in the asset pricing literature. Otherwise, your risk-free rate is excessively high and excessively volatile, right? We have to have capital accumulation, and the urban says that's really important. Uh, that smoothing uh, consumption, smoothing channel you have to have in the production economy. Otherwise, it's not literally a production economy, uh, right? So we're going to have that thing. And, uh, and uh, as mentioned, uh, like uh, two slides ago, I mentioned that uh, uh, we, 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 need to, we need to have some form of wage inertia to turn dividends procyclical. So that's why we, we, we deal with the labor market search. We, we, we more precisely, we analyze labor market frictions with the search model. So the setup um, is simple. Uh, following Monica Merce's 95 GME article, we're going to have representative household that pulls income from its employed as well as unemployed workers before making optimal consumption decisions. In other words, we have perfect uh, insurance within the household. Uh, so, so, so this way we can, we can write down a representative, uh, a write down a representative household. So uh, problem, so simplify the modeling big time. And then, you know, and then that assumption can be relaxed of course, but that's has, that extension has to be left for future, uh, future work. So representative firm, as in the, all the standard uh, macro labor uh, literature is gonna make uh, optimal vacancy decisions. And uh, we, because we have capital, we, analyze, we need to analyze a co uh, optimal investment policy as well. And the goal is to maximize market value of equity. Uh, labor market is model that's um, parsimoniously as a matching function that produces the number of new hires from combining the number of vacancies and number of unemployed workers. So wages are from um, um, generalized Nash bargaining process against the textbook model, the simplest uh, that we can find. And, they are, and in some of our um, other work, uh, we actually, uh, in the 2021 GME article uh, that we actually looked at uh, um, um, Hohen and Milgram, uh, uh, or, uh, credible bargaining game and there and we have more many more equations to solve with the capital we figure we gotta we 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 we, we better keep things simple so it turns out that my, uh, our intuition is that you can you can embed the model in a more realistic bargaining process more detailed structure underlying wage inertia uh, but uh, our intuition is that the basic results will continue to hold so, all right, so equations are coming up. Uh, recursive utility, fairly standard. Um, gamma is risk aversion and psi is uh, elasticity of intertemporal substitution. So the pricing kernel is this form, that, that's the contemporaneous consumption growth, but most of the action is coming from the, uh, the second term that is the continuation utility going forward. So. 
So um, uh, we were we were stuck for a long time um, uh, because we were we started out using Cobb Douglas uh, production function, uh, but it turns out that we were having all kinds of difficulty matching the equity premium. And in the in in, in our paper, we reported uh, different aspects of. Uh, um, of hints or numerical results. It's not the mathematical theorem uh, that uh, lots of um, auxiliary uh, quantitative results that seem to point to the necessity of the CES production function or, 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 or the inability of the Cobb Douglas production function to generate the uh, equity premium. I'll come back to this point later. Uh, but for now, this is the CES, okay? Um, Capital and labor combined together to produce output. Alpha is the distribution parameter, and the E. So this omega is linked up is linked to the elasticity of substitution between capital and the labor. Okay. So um, there are a few prior applications of this specification in the asset pricing literature. Uh, we read the, the, the CES literature a little bit more carefully. So it turns out uh, it's, it's better to work with uh, what people call normalized the CES function. So this there's a the famous 2000 AER article that we cite. Uh, so bottom line is that only after, only after the scaled capital has a similar unit as employment, okay? Only that under that condition will alpha be the capital share, okay? So that's the more accurate description and that's exactly what we do in the calibration. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna calibrate the scalar, which is simply a constant such that one minus alpha, one minus this distribution parameter matches the average labor share in the data, okay? In other words, alpha is the capital share in the data of output, capital share of output uh, in the data. So this normalized CES function is, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a polished. So we try, we try to polish rough edges of our, of our intellectual product. So this is one indication of our effort. So aggregate productivity, uh, AR1, uh, this total factor uh, uh, productivity is fairly standard. So all the, whatever, all the, um, all the funky dynamics, nonlinear disaster dynamics, they are all endogenous within the model. So again, we try to tidy up our execution. So we're gonna scale the long-term mean of X bar, the long, this, this is the long-term average level of total factor productivity. We're gonna rescale that, scale that, such that the average marginal product of labor is around one in our model simulations, right? So this is done to ease the interpretation of labor market parameters. For example, if our flow value of uh, unemployment activities is 0.9 in the model. If um, uh, marginal product of labor is around the one, then the flow value being 0.9 means the replacement rate is 0.9. So if on the other hand, the marginal product of labor is two in simulations or not exactly equal to one, let's just say two, a P value, a flow value of unemployment of 0.9 would be actually in effect would be 0.49, right? So we wanna we wanna ensure that uh, that uh, that uh, things are, uh, are as polished as as they can be, and this is another indication of our um, implementation. Right. So we're gonna be using Dan Hung, Remy, and Watson. Uh, matching function that we have been using for a while in a number of our articles. So at one point we did implement the Cobb Douglas uh, matching function, but then the, the vacancy filling rate as well as job finding rate will not be automatically between zero and one. Okay, so computationally you have to throw in a lot more occasionally binding constraints and that can be a, a pain in the neck without the obvious payoff. So again, we're just gonna 
simplify as much as we can to stick with um, this matching function due to Denham, Remy, and Watson, we find fairly convenient. So uh, employment um, accumulation, uh, fairly standard. The next period aggregate investment equals current period aggregated, uh, um, aggregate employment, the net of depreciation. Ooh, excuse me, I misspoke again. Net of separation rate, as is the separation rate. I've been working with the investment model all my career. So it's everything is instinct. So, so this is a net of uh, a separation rate and then plus number of new hires. The number of new hires would be um, total vacancies posted times the vacancy feeding rate, okay? So, and that the S is the separation rate is exogenous in the model. So we're not the modeling endogenous uh, job destruction, and that's um, so. That's uh, that's something in the talk uh, that uh, may may show up in our next paper. So who knows? Um, 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 maybe that's one worthwhile extension uh, going forward. So vacancy costs. This is total vacancy cost. A uh, kappa T would be the unit vacancy costs. Okay. So this specification follows from Pisaridis' uh, 2009 econometrica paper. Right, so we're gonna have, for asset pricing, we have to have uh, capital accumulation. So, so next period capital equal, equals current period capital, net of depreciation plus new capital. So for each dollar of investment you spend, you do not get dollar for dollar of capital, new capital. You get, for example, 0.85 cents of the capital out of $1 of investment. And that this fee function is the installation function that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is from, that we borrow from uh, Urban's 98, uh, 1998 the GME article. So extremely, extremely convenient um, is the installation function. And this new parameter is the supply elasticity of capital. And we're gonna follow urban again by setting uh, this A1, A2 parameter to be this functional form such that there will be no adjustment costs in the deterministic steady state. And you see this specification is quite parsimonious. There's only one free parameter that can choose the magnitude that governs the magnitude of adjustment costs so another uh, cool feature of Urban's specification is that, so um, when investment goes to zero, right? From a positive number goes to zero and the marginal benefit of investment is gonna go to infinity. So because of that cool feature, uh, investment endogenously solved from the model is never zero or negative. Right, you do not need to impose any irreversibility constraint manually uh, because investment will always be automatically positive, and we know at aggregate level investment is never negative. So this is fairly convenient. So this is why we love this uh, specification in in aggregate level modeling at the firm level or portfolio level. So uh, we 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 then use quadratic adjustment costs. All right, so Nash wage from, uh, uh, well, equilibrium wage is from the Nash bargaining game. So very standard. And uh, this is the marginal product of labor. Uh, intuitively, if you are more productive, you're gonna earn more. And uh, if, uh, if a worker is more popular on the labor market, right? So, and the vacancy, the, the costs of vacancy costs of lending a worker is higher and then the worker is gonna charge more out of the firm. And finally, if the worker can get the more just sitting at home, enjoying leisure, home production, uh, government handout or whatnot, uh, unemployment insurance or whatnot, right? So if the flow value of unemployment activity is high and then wages, wages must be high as well. So that's the standard, the Nash bargaining intuition. So the market value of the firm, uh, dividends equal output minus wage expenses minus total vacancy costs minus uh, investment. And the firm is gonna take a wage rate, stochastic discount factor, vacancy feeding rate, all as given, and to maximize the market value of equity, 
All right, and we're going to impose the vacancy um, non-activity constraint, and in this model, that constraint they will actually bind. So about the um, two and a half, three percent of the times. Okay, so it's not the, so it plays a small role, not the not the not the not the big role, but uh, it's um, but but it's not small enough for us to ignore it. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna program it in. So. So um, it's important to notice that, that when firms, when the representative firm makes optimal decisions, the firm is going to take vacancy feeding rate that's given. All right. In other words, the firm is not going to take the derivative of V inside the theta because that's given. Right. So that's the externality that the firm is ignoring. The firm is not internalized the congestion. Uh, effect of is raising uh, of is posing vacancies on other companies uh, in the economy. Uh, well, um, in 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 a sense of uh, in a sense of speaking, is uh, is of course we only have one representative firm, but uh, the vacancy externality is still there. All right, so recursive competitive equilibrium is fairly standard definition. Uh, investment, optimal investment vacancy, uh, vac uh, Lagrange multiplier on the uh, vacancy constraint and the consumption such that consumption solves the uh, consumption oil equation, investment solves the investment oil equation, and the vacancy and the Lagrange multiplier solve the intertemporal job creation condition as well as Kuhn cool Tucker condition while taking the uh, pricing kernel, equilibrium wage rate, as well as the vacancy feeding rate, all as given, right? So, and the, and the goods market will clear. So, um, so, so here is the investment oil equation. So um, actually fairly standard. So basically, so you have, you have left-hand side is marginal cost of investment. So the right-hand side is marginal benefit of investment. Okay, so I won't interpret uh, each term uh, on the right hand side. The detailed interpretation is written down carefully in the paper. So in the presentation, I'm gonna skip some details because our focus of this paper is asset pricing. So we're gonna define the investment return as, as the marginal benefit of investment within the brackets on the right hand side the term, the bracket that is multiplied with pricing kernel. So that term is the numerator of investment return. So investment return is the marginal benefit of investment next period divided by marginal cost of investment today. So in other words, investment return is the quantitative trade-off between benefit next period and the cost today. So analogously, so we have intertemporal job creation conditions. So first of all, we have Kuhn-Tucker condition here. And the first order condition uh, for vacancy and the employment combined together, you get the intertemporal uh, oil equation, job creation, oil equation. The left-hand side is marginal cost of hiring. The right-hand side is the marginal benefit of hiring. So after you pay the marginal costs, you get the get uh, one extra unit of employment and that workers is going to produce for you. You have to pay the wages and then net of separation. Hey, I said the separation, not depreciation this time. <laughs> so uh, net of separation, you get um, you get the, some extra unit of uh, uh, employment left and that's going to be worth the marginal cost of hiring for you next period, because the, you, you already have one unit in, you don't have the extra unit in, you don't have to go out and hire more. And that unit is gonna be worth uh, um, a marginal Q for, for employment uh, going forward at that point. So analogously, you can define hiring return as the, as the turn on the right-hand side within the bracket. So uh, the inner bracket that is multiplied with the pricing kernel, that's the marginal benefit of employment next period divided by marginal cost of hiring in the denominator. So the numerator is the marginal benefit of hiring. The denominator is the marginal cost of hiring. Marginal benefit is in the next period. Marginal cost, sorry, marginal benefit of hiring is in the next period, and marginal cost of hiring is in the current period. Okay, and that's the hiring return. Some uh, and then you can you can derive stock return. 
uh, a stock market return in the economy is a weighted average of investment return and hiring return. Okay, and this WK is the capital share in market equity. All right, so this is not alpha. Alpha is capital share in output. So uh, in a flow output in revenue. So this is capital share in the market value of equity. So, and, and, and that's basically, well, this is the market value, the, the fraction. So, so this is like, uh, well, in the Q theory of investment this is literally Q, but in the search model, Q is the standard notation for vacancy filling rate. We have to come up with a different notation. We use a mu instead. So mu K is the shadow value of capital. Okay, and the mu N is the shadow value of labor. So shadow value of capital equals the marginal cost of investment. Okay, so this is the first order condition for investment. All the derivations are in the internet appendix. Um, and the shadow value of labor is the marginal cost of hiring. Okay, so, and that's, uh, this is the definition of the capital share in market, in market equity. All right, so in terms of a numerical algorithm, and we are building on uh, um, uh, Pichoski, Nedung, and Zhang 2017 quantitative economics in a prior recording, uh, I have presented that um, article uh, uh, in a prior video, and I have presented that paper. I've gone into great details about uh, uh, our globally nonlinear projection algorithm with parameterized expectations. So because of the occasionally binding constraint for vacancy, so we opt to uh, approximate numerically uh, the function, the conditional expectation, which is smooth. Okay. And then we need to solve for the indirect utility function, investment function, and the conditional expectation function. Uh, from the recursive utility uh, investment oil equation and job creation condition. Okay, so we have three equations. We need to solve for three functions out of three functional equations. So we have three state variables. So aggregate total factor productivity, which we're, we're going to discretize using the Roman host procedure with 17 grid points. And 17 is fairly large, it covers. Um, eight unconditional standard deviations surrounding zero. In other words, it covers minus four unconditional standard deviation to plus four standard deviations, okay? And we use finite element method with cubic splines on 50 nodes on employment and 50 nodes on capital, okay? And we, and, uh, and we use tensor product to divide up the large state space of N and K, and on each tensor product literally means cross product. And you need to multiply all the possible um, combinations. And on each of the small region, and we fit the cubic spline on top of that. So this is the essence of the finite element method. And we, 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 uh, uh, we feel comfortable with the uh, accuracy with, uh, of this approach. So basically 17 times 50 times 50, uh, we have 4,200, uh, sorry, 42,500 equations and coefficients. For one functional equation, we have three functional equations. So in total, we have 42,500 uh, times three. So in total, we need to solve for 127,500 equations for the same number of coefficients. Say so such a large nonlinear system, uh, it took a while to, for us to get them to wrap our brains around such a um, tough um, numerical problem. So uh, that's why it took a while for us to uh, get to this point, but nevertheless, we are here. So we stumbled down to the derivative free fixed point iteration with a small damping parameter, oftentimes using in seminars. So we just, okay, all right, this is how we solve the model. We don't go into details, but oftentimes, you know, <laughs> in actuality, this is actually the most difficult part of, uh, of, uh, of this, this research program to get the, to get the, to get the numerical algorithm to, to converge and then spend a lot of time trying to understand exactly 
how the model behaves in its competitive equilibrium. All right, so let me let me go to calibration. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna calibrate the model to the Jota, uh, Schlerich, and Taylor macro history database uh, for business cycle and asset pricing moments. So uh, in our prior work, we were matching to we're calibrating to Baron and uh, and the Ursula macro uh, cross country panel. So the Jota panel is built on a Baron and the uh, Barrow's um, cross-country panel, but in addition, the Jota data set provides investment series as well. So that's why we ended up using this new data set and as well as asset prices. So annual series from 1871 to 2015, that's the end of their sample. So, um, so this slide, this table reports real consumption growth in the macro history database. Uh, the, that's the starting point for each country. Some countries start earlier or later than others. So um, on average, on average, the, the consumption volatility is 5.45% per annum. Uh, first order auto correlation is 12%. It's not zero, but it's not too high either. So now let's look at the post-war sample. After 1950, the consumption volatility is more than half. It's only 2.4% on average across countries. At the same time, consumption growth is much more persistent. Okay, it used to be only 0.12 in the historical panel. Now it's 0.46. So, and then in particular, the post-war US sample in which the asset pricing literature has overwhelmingly examined or focused on is 1.7% and 0.3 first order order correlation. So we interpret the evidence as saying the post-war US sample may not be that representative, um, okay? So that's why uh, that's why in the um, in the paper we mostly calibrate to the historical sample uh, in the same way that the recent barrel exogenous disaster literature has been doing, and uh, and I'll come back to this uh, representativeness of the post-war sample later, and uh, there I will I will I will acknowledge, acknowledge is actually maybe a uh, so it could be. Okay, let me just say it is, we think it is a weakness of our work, um, of our model. I'll come back to this point later. So in terms of uh, asset prices, the leverage adjusted equity premium is 4.36% uh, in that uh, historical panel, volatility is 16% per annum. Uh, per year. Risk-free rate is 0.8% per year. Volatility is quite a bit high, 7.3% volatility. So keep in mind this is an ex-post real interest rate volatility in which the inflation rate is calculated ex-post, not ex uh, In particular, you can look at uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Uh, they're, they're, um, because of a hybrid inflation and um, the runaway uh, inflation rates, the ex post uh, real interest rate volatilities can be pretty high. So uh, that's mostly uh, where the 7.3 estimate is coming from. For labor market moments, we mostly use um, uh, Pichoskin and Du and Zhang 2021 uh, GME article, and there we did the uh, uh, more. Uh, uh, geometric work, economic, uh, historical economic work, economic history work, and we compile, there we compile uh, historical time series of unemployment rate, uh, vacancies, as well as labor market, uh, uh, labor productivity by pulling together different sources of uh, uh, historical data. And, um, um, and we looked at, we looked around a little bit in terms of the in other countries, so unemployment rates data um, can, can be missing for a long, long, long period, multiple decades uh, missing. Uh, 
uh, following the Great Depression or during Second World War. So we ended up saying, all right, let's just use the US data that we have uh, some confidence in. So, when, well, in addition to, um, so in, in our prior work, in addition to the standard civilian unemployment rate, we also construct the private non farm unemployment rates following Labagot and uh, David Weir's uh, earlier important work. So, um, Labagot argues that, look, so private economy, private non farm unemployment rate uh, more accurately reflects the success or failure of private economy. Okay, and we are basically says, all right, so um, we cannot dismiss that. Uh, Lepogos argument, and there was a, um, a, a big debate in, uh, among economic historians, uh, whether to count the government employment as employment or, or, or unemployment, right? The standard definition, the more popular definition nowadays, people use civilian unemployment rate does count the government unemployment as employment. Uh, so uh, Weir argues that, all right, let's just provide both, okay? Um, both civilian unemployment as well as private down from unemployment rate, because in our in our model, uh, we do not have a government sector. We really only have a private economy. So we're gonna we're gonna calibrate. We're gonna try to match the the private non from unemployment rate. So um, um, so that 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 the, the average is close to nine percent, and the volatility is uh, twenty four point four percent per quarter. All right. So calibration. So, um, so we calibrate time discount factor to mostly match the, um, to help match the uh, mean risk free rate. And uh, we mostly follow the long run, long run risk literature in calibrating risk aversion. So uh, we, are, we are up to the upper bound, which is 10, and the EIS upper bound as well, uh, which is two. So persistence in log labor productivity, this is the log total factor productivity. Uh, we are following, we're using the same parameter value as in Greta and Chigari, um, a JPE article. So, and we calibrate this uh, condition of volatility um, of total factor productivity uh, to hit the average consumption volatility because our paper's focus is on asset prices. And we're just going to focus on we're going to hit the consumption volatility instead of output volatility. Okay, because consumption is directly impact on asset prices uh, through the consumption oil equation. So as noted earlier, we rescale the long run mean of log productivity so that the marginal product of labor is one on average. So we calibrate capital labor elasticity of substitution to be 0.4. Uh, that's the estimate in a recent um, AEJ macro paper by Chirinko. So I should uh, we provided extensive comparative statics uh, in the paper as we always do. So and our sense is that we need the elasticity to be in the in this lower range, uh, right? So, and, uh, and to help match equity premium without the blowing up consumption volatility. So in particular, in the uh, special case of Cobb Douglas in which the elasticity equals one, uh, we, this, was, this was two or three years ago, we were having all kinds of trouble uh, matching the equity premium uh, with, uh, without the blowing up consumption volatility. Once the consumption volatility is like 5.4% 5, 5 in the data, uh, the equity premium in the model is pretty low. It's like below 2% per year. Uh, so, so we had to switch. Uh, and then we ended up with the CES. So the distribution parameter is uh, with, the, with our normalized CES specification. So we're, we're going to calibrate that to match the average labor share close to uh, 0.75 in Golan 2002. So basically, we calculated the um, labor shares in the common set of the countries, common set of countries that show up both in Golan's data set and our uh, uh, and our data set, which is from uh, Jordan co-authors. Right, that's how we scale the capital scaler. The supply elasticity of capital, 
So 1.2, no direct uh, evidence available. And we pick that such that consumption volatility can be and the relatively controlled for as well as the equity premium can be matched. Uh, a monthly depreciation rate of capital, 1.25% per, per month. All right, separation rate, we're using 3%. So the joint average estimate for separation rate will be 3.5. Uh, SIP, survey, hmm, let's see if I remember, survey of income and the program participation, roughly speaking. So basically, uh, Mark Bills has, uh, and the co-authors have a paper, 2011 AEJ Macro. Uh, they estimate the separation rate in the in the in the in the SIP uh, data set to be about two percent. And the Mark's argument is that uh, look in the uh, SIP data set separations that uh, that go from job to job are excluded. And the separations that uh, with uh, that last within uh, four months, like with recourse within four months, uh, are, ex are excluded as well. So Mark argues that um, you know if you just stay home for uh, up to four months and go back to your um, previous job, you are really staying in the same job. You just re that should be a reduction in hours as opposed to uh, blowing up the separation rate. So, um, so between three and three point, uh, between two percent, uh, SIP estimate and the three point five uh, joints uh, estimate, uh, we are we are we are a bit leaning towards the joints estimate using between two and three point five. We are we, we, we are using three percent. Okay. Um, Again, we report comparative statics. So curvature in the matching function, we are using uh, this. We're using 0.9, and uh, uh, Wilder and the co-authors were using 1.27, whereas Hector Manuski uh, using 0.41, I believe. So we are we're kind of in the middle. So both the prior studies, they uh, those estimates were not the uh, empirical estimates. They were picked to match model mom moments. We are doing uh, kind of the same thing. The bottom line is that, uh, that the, our, our parameter value is not uh, unreasonable. That's the point we're trying to argue. All right, so, um, so, um, so, so one challenge in our calibration is that to match the equity premium without exaggerating the unemployment rate, mean unemployment rate, without blowing up the unemployment rate. So uh, through some try and errors, so we ended up with the calibration of uh, low bargaining weight for workers, relatively high flow value of unemployment. And at the same time, so these two combinations will, uh, well, especially the high flow value of unemployment, uh, B equals 91, that this is the replacement rate, 91%, all right? Especially this parameter will imply kind of a high unemployment rate. So, and this is why we, at the same time, simultaneously, we use relatively low values of vacancy costs. If kappa zero and kappa one are high as well, unemployment rate will go up, will blow up, will be higher than the empirical estimate. So it's a, it's a subtle um, balancing act. And of course, we also, we, I mean, we cannot use ADA, the bargaining with our workers being too high, unemployment rate will be too high as well. So, and uh, so we use a relatively low value of uh, bargaining weight. This way we, we, we generate the wage inertia and that's operating leverage, industriously speaking, and that helps generate the equity premium as, as I uh, presented uh, at, towards the beginning part of the presentation. So Hector Manoski were using 0.955. So, and, uh, and we interpret the high flow value simply as a metaphor or the simplest device possible to generate what Lundquist and Sargent calls small fundamental surplus. We want the fundamental surplus to be small for the firm such that we generate realistic unemployment uh, volatility. It turns out in our, <laughs> it turns out the same economic mechanism that people use in the macro labor literature for unemployment volatility puzzle. It's mm, 
it's the bulk, I wouldn't say exactly the same mechanism, I would say the most, the bulk of the mechanism that also drives the equity premium puzzle in the financial market. So by modeling the two sides together, we get to derive some, some um, we feel uh, deep insights. So finally, we should also point out that uh, the high replacement rate is not the only of uh, historical interest only. And there's a recent article uh, by these three authors who argue that uh, uh, during the COVID, the uh, you know, government release uh, act, the, uh, the, 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 mean, the mean replacement rate is actually a uh, replacement rate is actually 100%, the median is 135%. <laughs> so, the, so the April jobs report and uh, a lot of people feel um, the, the, the uh, employment number, the new, new jobs gained, um, that number is disappointing because the replacement rate currently is too high. Um, the government is paying workers to stay at home. Hmm. Um, so, so as noted, we are right. So, and then as noted, with the low worker sparkling rate, so you're going to generate wage inertia, and in the model is 0.28, and uh, and the, our empirical estimate in the uh, historical uh, data series that we compiled for this paper is 0.27. Right. Let me go through the details. So, Hector Manoski estimate the wage elasticity to be 0.45 in the post-war US sample. And uh, we went through, uh, we draw elements from uh, Gordon's 2016 book on uh, American, uh, um, the rise and fall of American growth. So on, on uh, economic history. So uh, we measure, um, so this is how we draw our uh, data together. So, um, so I think Gordon, Gordon was using NIPA data out of 29, after 29. So, um, right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip the details and that they are all written down here uh, as well as uh, in, the, in, the, in our paper. So for, for the sample prior to 1929, we are using the data available from measuring at the measuringworld.com by Officer and Officer Williamson. So uh, one, one thing is that um, uh, we try to be careful on their data, on their website, uh, the data, the series is only available uh, with two digits after the decimal. So we wanted to, uh, we wanted to, uh, to, to read about the underlying material. So I, so I spent, uh, um, so I spent over $200 uh, buying, uh, buying their book. But Office of 2009, it's a very thin book, 170 pages long. So it cost me, uh, cost more than $200. So they do important work, but uh, it looks like the market is small. So you have to pay more. And I was happy to do that anyway. So, um, so but in their table seven, seven in officer's table uh, 7.1, so he's reporting three digits after decimal. So we ended up using the, uh, the table table 7.1 from the from from the book as opposed to the website. All right, uh, lots of other details. So uh, I which I will skip. So we use the historical labor market series from our um, recent GME article. Uh, bottom line is that using our data set annual, and we estimate the post war. Uh, wage elasticity to labor productivity to be 0.41. Okay, this is annual series, a different series. So uh, it's not exactly 0.45 as estimated in Hector Manuski, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, we interpret it as a mostly a replication, um, mostly successful replication. So in particular, once we use our extended historical sample, the wage elasticity to be 0.267, uh, and which is fairly close with, with what we get in the data. All right, unconditional moments. So uh, we simulate out of the model stationary distribution, uh, we simulate 10,000 artificial samples, and we calculate the basic moments on each sample. As noted, we're targeting the consumption volatility. As you can see, that's what we have. 
uh, first order order correlation is a little bit higher than that in the data, but p values, uh, none of them are significant. By the way, the p value is the fraction out of the 10,000 artificial samples for which the data, the model moment is higher than the data moment. Okay, so if p value is below 5%, or higher than 95%. So then we know uh, the model is rejected, but in this case, none of the p-values are significant. So we say the model mm, is doing an okay job matching basic consumption dynamics. So output were blowing up. <coughs> the output the volatility, because in the historical sample, as first pointed out by Barrow and the Ursula 2008 uh, article, so they argue that uh, because of wartime financing, government spending, consumption volatility is actually higher, 5.45, higher than the output volatility. And of course, we know because of consumption smoothing, output volatility in the model is always higher than consumption volatility. So we have to make a call. Uh, we have to take a stand because this paper is focusing on asset prices. So we're going to take a stand on insisting on matching uh, consumption uh, volatility will um, let the output the volatility kind of go, but even that the p-value is not significant either. So we're probably fine. Uh, um, but the, but skewness and ketosis are screwed up um, in, in, in the sense of significant p-values. So can, uh, investment volatility in the model is um, significantly lower than that in the data. So I guess uh, nobody's perfect. Um, in terms of uh, unemployment, uh, we are not further higher. We are not much higher than that in the data, 9.4% 9, 9 versus 8.94% and p-value is insignificant. So I should acknowledge that unemployment volatility is a bit higher than that in the data, so is vacancy volatility. Uh, but uh, but um, but the labor market volatility is uh, quite a bit lower than that in the data. So I should mention that the, the, this data moment, as detailed in the paper, this data moment is sensitive to the trending method. So because vacancy uh, constraint can be binding in the model, so we are not using log log deviation uh, uh, from the HP trend. If you do that, that estimate is actually 0.38. So it's, it's in that case closer, much closer to the model moment, but nevertheless, it is what it is. So, and the, another weakness of the match is that the, the, the UV correlation, vacancy unemployment co uh, correlation uh, is minus 0 0.57 in the data in the model is only 0 0.11 minus. So, so, uh, so, so, so we are, we are, um, we are in the talks about uh, you know the next extension of the model. Uh, maybe maybe different perturbations of the specification can improve things uh, along this dimension. But that has that has to be the next paper. So again, the focus of the paper is mostly on asset prices. So which we fit reasonably well. Um, equity premium and in particular. Uh, stock market volatility. So the prior attempts of GE production economies, so this estimates is only like one third, between one third to one half of what we have, actually closer to one third than one half. So this is a, um, um, a measure of success, I would say. So volatility for real, for real interest rate, 2.5 in the model was versus 7.3. Uh, in the data, as noted earlier, so 7.3 estimate is mostly due to hyperinflation uh, in the historical sample, uh, solving uh, default, uh, which we do not model. So we, we are not going to agonize over that. Uh, so we're just going to be, we're going to report the evidence, uh, but the interpret accordingly. So key intuition is wage inertia. And to illustrate how the, how the, key mechanism works within the model. So we're going we're gonna to calculate the nonlinear impulse responses. So as, as our 2017 quantitative economics articles shows, 
impulse responses depend on initial conditions uh, because of the model's strong nonlinearity. All right. So in this case, we're going to consider three cases: uh, bad economy, median economy, and good economy. So bad economy is the tenth percentile of the model stationary distribution of uh, uh, total factor productivity, capital, and the employment. Median economy is the median 50th percentile. Well, and the good economy is the 90th percentile. Okay, so the, the, the red lines are the impulse responses in the presence of one standard deviation shock on total factor productivity at the period zero, and that the rest are basically responses. So we see that take the red line, that's the median economy, red line. So basically, upon in, pretty much upon impact, uh, the output drops by close to 1.8%. OK? So and if you look at the wages, wages, the scale is different. Wages drops only by 0.4%, 1.8 versus 0.4. So wages are clearly inertial. So correspondingly, so profits drops by almost 5% and the dividends drops by, you know, close to five, like 4.8% 4, 4 or so. Bottom line is that because of wage inertia and you get dividend dropping uh, by, by, a, by, by a large amount, more than output, okay? Dividend is pro-cyclical and risky. That's the median economy. Now let's look at the bad economy. So in the presence of one standard deviation, negative shock on total factor productivity. So output falls by about 3.8%. That's the lowest point right here. Okay. Look at what happens to wages. In the first two periods, wages are actually constant, right? I mean, it dips a little bit and then goes up a little bit. I mean, it's virtually constant in the first one and a half, two years. Only towards the end of the 10 year horizon, wages drops by, you know, one and a half, 0.15%, not the one and a half. Well, sorry, probably one and a half percent. So while well, the detailed estimates are in the paper, I'm just eyeballing my slide now. So now why is more importantly, why is wage relatively constant in the first two periods? So precisely in bad times, wages are most inertial in precisely bad economy. So how can that be? Well, it's because of the vac unit vacancy cost, right? Kappa T equals kappa zero plus kappa one times uh, Q. And Q is the vacancy feeding rate, and vacancy feeding rate is counter cyclical. Counter cyclical is low in good times and uh, approaches one in bad times. Okay, so the unit, the unit vacancy cost is counter cyclical, and that counter cyclical force is going to enter wages, and that's going to prevent wages to fall, right? Because in bad economy, the vacancy feeding rate is highest. Right, and that's 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 the re that reinforces the wage inertia, and that's what's reflected here. And this is the so our source of time varying risk premium. So everything is endogenous. So as a result, because wage is most inertial, precisely in bad times, you see profits for more. That's down here. So like um, uh, uh, more than 7%, 7.2% or so. And the dividends forced the most by a whopping 17.7%. That I remember. So 17.7% was, was too big when, 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 when I was writing, uh, doing the final touches on the paper, 177 that just ironed into my brain. Uh, way, dividends fall by, uh, by a whopping 17.7%. So, and this is the power for uh, propagation mechanism that generates pro-cyclical pro dividends uh, due to wage inertia and due to the, 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 the um, labor market frictions. 
and we are using Nash, Nash wages. So as the starting point, because of low worker sparkling weight and uh, mostly low worker sparkling rate. All right, so and the model uh, exhibit um, uh, endogenous disasters as first pointed out uh, by, uh, by my prior work in 2018 at AER with uh, Pachowski Nedun and Kuhn. So uh, in our model, we are matching towards consumption disasters, and you can see it right here. Uh, disaster probability is 6.7 versus 6.4 in the data, and p-value is insignificant. Size is the, like from peak to trial. On average, we are looking at 23.7%, uh, close to that in the data, so is duration. We're blowing up. Uh, we are, we are overshooting the output uh, uh, disaster probability and it's significant. The difference is significant, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but we're not gonna agonize over that. All right, time memory risk premium. So this is uh, basically out of the models, out of the model stationary uh, distribution. So after certain a burning period out of the model stationary distribution, we simulate the one million months and uh, plot the key moments against a total factor, the level of total factor productivity, total factor productivity. So we are inspired by the, you know, all kinds of COVID maps. So we're gonna report the heat maps as well. So you see that the, the, the dark red color means more density, the lighter, green color means lower density okay just like a covid map so you can see price dividend price consumption ratio uh, we do not compute the price dividend ratio because dividends in the model are net payouts which can be negative so this is price consumption ratio consumption is always positive in that condition in the model so price consumption ratio is procyclical and this is the conditional equity premium is calculated that way, equity premium is clearly counter-cyclical. The, the, the unit on the vertical axis is percent per month. So stock market volatility counter-cyclical again, the unit is again percent per month. So risk-free rate um, is largely acyclical. In other words, not very predictable or hardly predictable at all. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's acyclical. So consumption, expected consumption growth behaves pretty much like risk-free rate. In other words, I should say risk-free rate behaves pretty much like the expected consumption growth and is largely procyclical as well, right? So this panel is conditional consumption volatility. It's a little bit more action than Consumption growth, expected consumption growth is, is mostly acyclical. If anything, you see some weekly procyclicality as well. Uh, we did a ton of um, uh, quantitative match between the model moments and data moments. So this is the, we follow Beeler and Campbell 2012 at the critical finance review, the empirical setup, how you forecast uh, stock market access returns, how do you forecast stock market volatility. So this is the cross-country panel. We implement the Beeler-Campbell tests on the uh, Jota and the co-author macro history uh, panel. This is what we have. So um, yeah, uh, this is what we have in the data. You see in the model, we get close for predicting stock market access returns. The slopes and t-values are all negative, uh, although our t-value are a bit slightly more significant, but look at the t, t statistics, but look at the p-values, none of which are significant. For predicting stock, uh, for, for predicting consumption volatility, so we have some, so we exaggerated the amount of uh, predictability for consumption growth a little bit, not by a whole lot. So R square 5.8 percent at the five-year horizon in the data. In the model, we have 11.1 percent. Okay. So although our slopes are more significant, uh, but look at the p-values other than first year. So uh, the two 
uh, p-values other than first year, all the other p-values are insignificant. So we say this is uh, mostly fine, um, I think. All right, so for volatilities, uh, we also, the model also uh, does a good job in predicting stock market volatilities. So, um, um, although the R score is a bit lower, okay, so P values are significant, uh, but the signs go right, uh, but the model is having more trouble uh, explaining uh, the predictability of consumption growth volatility. So the signs are flipped, although in the post-war sample, the data, in the data, the signs are flipped as well. But importantly, and you look at the p-values, what the model is, uh, can be rejected out of this moment. So bottom line is that the model exaggerated the predictability, predictability for consumption growth slightly, exaggerating that for consumption growth volatility more, uh, but the model does a good job in explaining the predictability for stock market excess returns as well as stock market volatilities. All right, so let me get to uh, comparative statics. So the headline result in this section is that the Tallarini separation result fails, breaks down in the sense that risk aversion matters big time for macroeconomic dynamics. So we have the table here. The first column is the benchmark calibration. So in which gamma equals 10. So if we reduce gamma from 10 to 7.5 and further to five, so consumption volatility drops from 5.4 to four, Output volatility drops as well. So, and consumption disaster probability drops from 6.7 to 4.4. As a result, equity premium drops from, this is not surprising. So we, we, we make an agent less risk averse. So drops from 4.27 to 0.45. Okay, as amount of lower consumption uh, risk and the lower risk premium and discount rate and uh, the unemployment rate jobs, mean unemployment jobs from uh, 9.4 more than half to 4.3, although volatility is actually increasing slightly. All right, so So in addition, the labor market parameters also impact on financial markets. In particular, look at the flow value of unemployment activity. So in the benchmark calibration is 0.91. So if we reduce it slightly, so 0.91 will be like an event horizon on the boundary of the event horizon. You are not in the black hole yet in which everything goes haywire and lots of nonlinearity more than we can handle. Right, well, right at the, uh, you know, uh, uh, benchmark calibration, event horizon. And, but, uh, but if you, it's like you approach the nonlinearity, uh, once you kind of move away from that, then, then you lose a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the nonlinearity. So if we reduce flow value from 0.91 to 0.88, so consumption volatility drops to 3.2, Unemployment jobs from 9.4 to 3.45. Okay, and, dis and disaster, consumption disaster probability 6.7 to 3.4. As a result, the equity premium pretty much vanishes from 3.4 to 0 0.6. So, in other words, labor market tightly impact on financial market as well in this model. So, everything is tied up. And uh, whatever the B channel, the small surplus channel that uh, Lundquist and Sargent were talking about uh, in their 2017 AER paper. So whatever the key me mechanism explaining the unemployment volatility uh, puzzle is also a key mechanism for explaining the equity premium puzzle. Um, ADA mostly affects the wage elasticity to labor productivity. So I'm going to fly through the rest of the comparative statics. 
So um, uh, lots of subtleties. We try to be as careful as we can in learning as much as we can. Uh, there are some subtleties about the raising the vacancy cost parameters. I'm not going to uh, get into the details. It turns out the adjustment cost basically trades uh, adjustment cost parameter, um, the supply, the supply uh, elasticity of capital doesn't affect output volatility that much, but simply trace consumption volatility for or redistribute volatility between consumption growth and the investment growth. Okay, and of course, once you lower consumption growth volatility, consumption volatility, equity premium is going to suffer, and that's the that replicates the key insight from Urban's earlier work, Yerman um, uh, ninety eight GME article, which is pretty cool. Um, so um, let's see. So if we raise capital share, okay, uh, that means labor market frictions play a less prominent role in the model and then the risk and risk premiums will drop. Okay, and uh, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip all that and, uh, and, uh, and uh, try to push towards the end. Additional implications. So uh, this is a cool result. So uh, thanks to a referee uh, comment that, uh, that we have benefited a lot. So investment versus hiring return, investment return versus hiring return. So as noted earlier, we calibrate the labor share in output to be 0.746, which is relatively high in the high end, right? Obviously, we always say labor share uh, 70 to 75, uh, uh, right? So we are calibrating towards to the higher end. Uh, but surprisingly, at first glance, at least, the capital share in market value of equity is only slightly over 7%, right? In particular, the capital share, capital share in output is slightly less than 25%, but capital share in market value of equity is 92.6%. That's the WKK here, okay? And in particular, as noted earlier, the stock market return is a value weighted average between the investment return and the hiring return. The fact that capital share in market value, the value weight of capital or capital share in market value is so down high, 90, uh, close to 93%, it turns out um, uh, most of the stock market dynamics are driven by investment return dynamics. Okay, of course, investment return dynamics are further impacted on substantially by labor market frictions, like B parameter, for example. Um, in addition, the hiring return uh, mean and the volatility are an order of magnitude higher than their investment return counterparts. The mean hiring return is 41%. The mean investment return is only 5.3%. The volatility of hiring uh, return is 186%, whereas the, the volatility of the investment return is, um, is close to 10%. In fact, the hiring returns are so drastic. So these numbers are actually cross simulation mediums instead of the mean, because in finite sample, actually not that finite anymore. We tried the, all these numbers are out of 10,000 simulations. We actually patiently waited for, 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 for four days uh, to get the 100,000 simulations. It turns out multiple runs of 1,000, 100,000 simulations turns out that, that the, the cross simulation median of a hiring return still keeps changing uh, between one run to the next uh, run of 100,000 simulations. And then we realize uh, this is an intrinsic feature of the model. So we better just report the cross sectional medians. All right, I'm gonna skip the comparative statics details uh, on these key moments. And uh, you can see the paper for the detailed discussions. Uh, same on this slide as well. So I'm just going to focus on, uh, on on the scatter plot, and I'm going to say a few more words about the scatter plot, which is pretty cool. So the right panel is the labor sharing output. So as noted, on average, is about the 74.6% right here, right? So in bad times, it increases. 
which is not surprising. This is pretty well known, right? Labor share is a uh, uh, wage rate times aggregate employment divided by output. Okay, so uh, because wages are inertial, uh, inertia due to labor market frictions, so uh, wage the late the wage share the labor share is gonna be higher out of output in bad times because wages doesn't move much while as output drops more in bad times. Okay, so this is why in uh, in bad times labor share can go up to like eighty five uh, or even ninety percent. Okay, so this is counter cyclical. Uh, uh, counter cyclicality of labor share that is due to labor market, mostly due to labor market frictions. The small amount of it is due to the CES production function. Well, let's look at the left panel. This is new in the literature. So, um, so uh, at least based on our reading of the literature, I have not seen a prior discussion of this feature, um, both in asset pricing and in macro. So this is the capital share in the market value of equity. It turns out the mean is 92.6% as noted earlier. And, uh, and the down thing is that capital share in value is counter cyclical. In bad times it approaches 100%, right? It can get to 100% in bad times. So at first glance, this was actually surprising to me. I was like, really, did we make a mistake? All right, so after double check, triple check our codes, and then they suddenly dawn to us, this is correct. This is how the model is supposed to work. Because precisely because, so as noted very, very early on in the presentation, wages are expenses. They are expensed away from earnings of the firm. So they are not part of the cash flow, uh, free cash flow, so net payouts back to shareholders. They cannot be counted as the part of, they cannot be counted towards the stock market value, right? Only the vacancy costs are investments in human capital, in workers, not human capital, I'm abusing uh, vocabulary now, are investments in workers uh, in employment that can deliver future payoffs for the firm, that part enters uh, the stock market valuation, but that part is small because we have a relatively low vacancy cost calibration, right? So, 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 so basically the stock market is mostly for shareholders, for contribution to, to the contributors of capital, uh, right? So, and this is not to workers. So if you see, think workers and shareholders are like, you know, uh, some, some two different classes uh, in, in, in the Marxist economy, for example, uh, Marxist analysis of the capital, uh, capital economy, a market economy, for example, this will be exactly what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what he was talking about. So the stock market is still pretty much just for shareholders. In particular, in bad times, the shadow value of worker for the firm is that can actually with very, very small probability up there, like in the simulations, 0.28% out of 10,000 simulations, but extremely small um, probability that can actually be negative. The shadow value of worker can actually be negative. Uh, imagine, right, in the darkest, days of the COVID crisis, like right? March, April uh, of 2020, right? So if the United Airlines and Delta Airlines or, uh, or, or you know, other airlines around the world, you would really like to uh, lay off workers. Some airlines were indeed laying off workers because their current labor force was too large for them because it was nobody was flying. Um, uh, Warren Buffett uh, during the 2020 shareholder meeting, Berkshire, Berkshire shareholder meeting, he said he was, he, Warren was very pessimistic, very bearish. He was he kept talking about Great Depression. He, he was saying we dumped all the airline stocks because there were just too many planes, all right? Too many planes sitting on the, sitting on the tarmac, so sitting on the ground and workers were taking, taking, taking home pays, but, uh, but they had no, no revenues because there were no flyers or very few fly flyers. So anyway, so under that scenario, the shadow value of worker is actually negative. Although the firm doesn't exit the economy because the stock market, the, the, the stock prices 
are still positive because of the capital component of the value. As we show in the earlier scatter plot, a heat map of price to consumption ratio. All right, okay, let me move on. So I thought this is a pretty pretty cool uh, figure, especially the left panel that, uh, that no one has reported it before. So we have a few other uh, auxiliary uh, results, one of which is uh, is the timing premium. So by uh, Epstein, uh, Larry Epstein and the co-authors have a, a cool article 2014 at AER, so in which um, Larry and co-authors criticized the long risk literature and some calibration of the disaster literature uh, that, uh, that the timing premium, the implied timing premium was just implausibly high. Uh, Larry points out that, look, you are in your uh, in the typical uh, calibration of the uh, recursive uh, absence in well preferences. So risk aversion is higher than one over EIS, right? So, and that means the agent prefers early resolution of uncertainty, but still it's worthwhile to ask whether that the degree of early resolution uh, early uh, desire for early resolution of uncertainty is reasonable or not. So Larry and co-authors uh, answer is that no, they're not reasonable. Uh, the timing premium is defined as the fraction of uh, um, consumption that the investor is willing to sacrifice in forever in perpetuity uh, such that the uncertainty can be resolved in day one. Right, so that's the so. How much would you willing to pay to resolve the uncertainty earlier? That's the earlier re um, resolution, right? But keep in mind that just resolve the uncertainty. You cannot change your optimal consumption stream afterwards. It's simply you know what's going to happen. When are you going to, you know, in a matter of speaking, uh, when are you going to, you know, pass, for example? So and uh, but you cannot do anything about it. How much would you? Uh, pay right uh, for me. I would rather not to, not not to find out. So um, so 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 Larry's point is that, and co-author's point is that. Look, you are, some of the estimates is way too high. Thirty-one percent in Benson and Rome, uh, forty-two percent in uh, uh, Walker's two thousand thirteen Journal of Finance paper as a pretty cool paper uh, with time-bearing disaster probability process. And uh, I guess the, 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 the comment would be the persistence in the time variant disaster probability is too high, uh, therefore giving rise to a relatively high uh, timing premium. In our setup, it turns out the long run risk plays a limited role and our timing premium is only 16.1%. Uh, we have some estimates in the, data, uh, in the simulated um, uh, data, we show the persistence in, expe in expected consumption growth is only 0.3, as, as opposed to 0.98 in Benz on Iran. And our persistence in consumption volatility uh, is a bit high, but only 0.96, uh, not higher as in uh, a typical long run risk calibration. So we, we do not have the uh, pitfall uh, that some of the prior literature has. Welfare cost of business cycles are fairly well known and uh, Lucas 87 book uh, first uh, first implemented. He was estimating um, basically five basis points. And, uh, and in our calculation, in our model, we have a realistic equity premium that is also time bearing. We get a 33.6%. Okay, so the calculation is really, really simple because of linear homogeneity uh, in the in the recursive utility. So it's it's kind of cool to to, to work it out. I was worried that in uh, for a while about the too good to be true, but it turns out it was correct about the calculation of uh, welfare costs with the recursive utility. It turns out you can simply pull the welfare cost out. It's extremely simple because of linear homogeneity. All right, on top of that, the welfare cost is counter-cyclical. We are plotting on the left panel, welfare cost against aggregate productivity, counter-cyclical in bad times, it jumps up more. So, so policies are important. Government policies are important in combating against, uh, in combating uh, large recessions, uh, even disasters. 
and the right panel is plotting against unemployment. Okay, is clearly an increasing function of unemployment rate. So, so uh, uh, Jules and Ralph and Michael Brand have been uh, writing about the downward sloping equity term structure, and uh, and uh, and uh, they argue it's inconsistent with the leading asset pricing models. So, and the other, you know, based on our reading, other researchers point out, look, your sample is too small. So uh, it's not clear to what extent that you should take the evidence to the bank. And with that caveat in mind, and I wish to point out that in our model, uh, that, that, that equity yield, the equity term structure is downward sloping consistent uh, with their evidence. So the intuition is that because we have disasters in the model, the short-term equity is directly impacted by uh, disasters, whereas long-term equity less so because disasters are followed by recoveries, right? So if you hold the equity for the long run, for the long term, you are you 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 can patiently wait for the recoveries. Um, so consumption uh, strips as well. All right. So let me conclude. So uh, in this paper, searching for the equity premium. So uh, after uh, ten years of effort, I think we have figured out uh, mm, the essential ingredients to put together to form a unified theory of asset prices and business cycles. So recursive utility, search frictions, and the capital accumulation. So now the model is successful. Uh, we believe in, uh, in, in, in many essential dimensions, uh, but the, the model is by no means perfect at all. So uh, there, are, there, are, there are various issues uh, that I've tried to acknowledge. Um, in the presentation, before I conclude, let me acknowledge one more, uh, the most important weakness, which concerns the representativeness of the post-war US sample. It, so out of our 10,000 simulations, so we look at what's the percentage of sample pass that, that has equity premium as high as what we have observed in the post-war US sam sample, but consumption volatility uh, as low as the post-war US sample. It turns out that fraction is zero. We cannot find a single sample path that can generate a sample like the post-war US sample. Okay, so I interpret, we interpret this as a weakness of the model. We think similar problem may show up in the risk barrel, excuse me, exogenous disaster literature as well. Okay, so, and the challenge is how do we generate high enough equity premium with lower consumption volatility? Right now we are at, we're calibrating the model to the uh, Jordan and the co-author macro history a panel with consumption volatility of 5.45, right? And it's reasonable to ask the question whether we can lower that target, lower that consumption volatility target, therefore raising the hurdle on the model even further, at the same time, match the equity premium uh, like that in the uh, post-war US sample. So taking a step back, it's also possible that, uh, that it may, you know, maybe institution, uh, economists are right in the, are, are, are correct in the sense that maybe the economy has evolved, right? Policy making is becomes better. Great mod moderation uh, was was indeed in play despite the great recession, right? And maybe 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 is basically maybe it's infeasible or maybe too ambitious to use a single mathematical model as a unified um, theory not only for asset price and business cycles, but for historical sample and the different historical periods and post sample and historical sample altogether. I just want to acknowledge that weakness. So I think, uh, I think that but, uh, if we want to stay within the mathematical framework, uh, theoretical framework, so the hurdle would be uh, whether we can, whether one, uh, us or somebody else, can explain the equity premium, the same level of equity premium with the even lower consumption volatility, all right, to generate something like the post-war US sample, okay? All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.